Back here on the Meat Speak podcast, powered by the Certified Angus Beef Brand. Brian Schaff here, coming to you from uh, home quarantine. Uh, but with us on the line are two folks who have a really unique perspective. You know, most times when we talk uh, to folks on this podcast, of course, we're always talking about meat. We're always talking generally about beef, honestly. Uh, and uh, these folks fill that vein as well, although they're not necessarily from the, the cooking background of things, although that is not to discredit their kitchen prowess by, by any means. But joining us on the line uh, from, uh, we'll say, outside of Leavenworth, Kansas, uh, is uh, Miss Cara Lee, and all the way from Chapel, Nebraska, which is actually in that little notched out portion of Nebraska where it looks like the, the puzzle creators fit Colorado in, uh, is Mr. Paul Dykstra. Guys, how you doing? I'm great, Brian. How are you? And, great, Brian. And I'm, I'm, I'm caffeinated and ready to talk about some cattle. You both have a unique perspective because, um, you know, full disclosure, you do technically work for certified Angus beef, but both of you in your own right have cattle. Kara, can, can you tell us a little bit about your operation and what you guys do? I mean, what you guys raise and, and uh, you know, what, what's all happening around you there in, uh, in your Leavenworth, Kansas? So we are, uh, we are positioned in the Glacial Hills portion of Kansas. So uh, kind of east of the Flint Hills, just about an hour from downtown Kansas City. Um, on, on our small family operation, we are diversified with row crop production and a commercial Angus cow-calf herd. Um, we do a little bit of spring calving, primarily fall calving, um, which means that uh, the, the greater part of our calf crop is actually getting ready to be weaned. Here, uh, first, first weekend of May, here this weekend, we'll um, get those fall calves up, wean those calves um, ourselves and lots of farmers around us. Everybody's getting ready for planting season. Um, farm implements are running. Uh, everybody's still going to put a crop in the ground. Um, COVID-19 doesn't put a stop on how the seasons change. Um, doesn't put a stop on the fact that the, the crop still needs to go in. Um, that's, that's just a little bit about us. We are not unique in our part of the world in the fact that we are diversified. Um, obviously, I have a full-time job with Certified Angus Beef. Um, my husband also has a part-time job as an agronomist. Um, we would be smaller compared to a lot of farms in the area um, where it's a, a full-time business for one or more um, of the adults within the family. So uh, certainly from a, a personal level, it's something, you know, the things that are going on in the market, we feel it. Um, but it, in, in my opinion, it just allows me to empathize with those um, at a little higher level who, who rely on that, uh, that farm or the cattle income for, for a full-time uh, full income. Paul, can you tell us about your operation? Yeah, much like Kara, uh, my day job here with Certified Angus Beef certainly keeps me occupied. Oftentimes that's day and night, depending on what's going on. So that's the, the primary focus for me, but uh, I, I have a lifelong uh, addiction to cows and that has uh, driven me to, to own some cows. My kids own some cows and we kind of fill in the edges around, uh, for me work and for my kids school, and we fill in the edges with cows and uh, we enjoy that quite a bit. But, Given that uh, the work schedule does require quite a bit of time, we, uh, we partner with a couple of friends, one, one rancher and one farmer, to, uh, to take care of our cows at least part of the time, if not year round, uh, so that uh, we can be free to do the other things that we need. But we do have a cow-calf operation, and it's, it's relatively small, but we are in the commercial cattle business that way and provides me... Uh, uh, the link to the to the heritage of our family and and the way of life that that uh, we love. So that's that's what kind of keeps us entertained. So as all of this stuff is going on with the you know the virus that has shut a lot of things down, and we've had a lot of discussions about restaurants and food service distributors and a lot of the struggles that they're seeing. Um, we haven't had much of a discussion on what's happening all the way back on the ranch. And, and, and both of you can speak really, really well to that. Um, probably a topic that, that should be talked about a little more. Um, Kara, I'll, I'll throw to you first. I mean, can you just give us a, a sense of, of what is uh, the mindset of farmers and ranchers who are raising a lot of these cattle that, uh, you know, that, that eventually get to those end users? 
You know, Brian, uh, the, the agriculture community is not unique um, in terms of how, how they've been impacted by the far-reaching effects of, of the COVID-19 crisis we're in. Um, you know, it's, uh, I don't know if it's, it's ironic or whatnot, but as I listen to some of the challenges and the, uh, the creative ways that many of our food service partners have come together, um, come up with creative ways to, uh, to stay in business, um, there's a lot of ingenuity there that we see on the, the cattle producer side of things as well. Um, whether it's from my personal experience or folks who, who farm or ranch on a much, much larger scale than, than we do ourselves, um, it, it's, it's serious. Um, it's, it's a very sincere time of concern, um, much like any community you go to across the globe today. There's uncertainty about what tomorrow is going to bring. Um, but when I say uncertainty, it doesn't mean that uh, it, it doesn't mean it's the absolute end of the line. Um, you know, we we have adversity. We try to let that adversity breed creativity. Whether that's um, thinking about different ways that we manage cattle, market cattle. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of uncertainty going on, but we're going to come out of it on the other side at some point. Paul, uh, when it comes to, you know, one of the buzzwords, of course, for the last month and a half has been the idea of social distancing, which in Western Nebraska, maybe that's not as difficult. But, you know, there are still, you know, there are still folks out your way, raising animals, working farms, things like that. What are some of the things that you guys have, have kind of had to adjust, um, adjust with, with what you guys are doing um, on the ranch to, to, I guess, account to, to make sure that you know, everybody's kind of singing from the same songbook and all this. Well, yeah, from the from a social distancing and, and, and taking care of our our health at the ranch level, folks are, as you said, positioned such uh, in terms of geography much of the time that it's not a problem. As a matter of fact, the main concern for many in the at the cow calf level of the beef production system would be how do we how do we uh, socialize rather than how do we not do so? Uh, so looking for opportunities to socialize would be the norm in conditions outside of uh, of this COVID nineteen induced environment. So it's not been a, a big uh, trouble spot for producers to maintain distance normally just not in a place where uh, we're coming into contact with a lot of people at the ranch level one thing that is kind of a right now item particularly in in my region and other regions of the west and north uh, of, the, of the states right now would be the fact that uh, it's time to work calves it's time to brand and vaccinate and um, do those those seasonal things that are uh, very much upon us and, and have been going on right now. And typically that would require a group of neighbors and friends to get together to provide enough labor to, uh, to manage all the tasks that are uh, affiliated with, with working those, those large groups of calves on one day. And so many folks have cut back the number of people in that operation to do so, cutting back on certainly the elderly and the very young uh, being present for that and really just, so to speak, getting by with what would be otherwise a, a skeleton crew uh, to make sure that we aren't gathering up with too many people in that setting. You know, if, if you read a lot of the headlines and, and there seems to be a lot of discussion going on about uh, meat supplies and beef gets thrown into that a lot. Uh, as you see um, certain certain packing plants of whether it's pork, whether it's chicken, whether it's beef beginning to, to get hit by uh, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus and, and having to, to momentarily shut things down. Um, can can you talk to us about what you guys are seeing on your end as the ones who you know if the if the plants aren't running i mean where are the cattle going well there's been a fair amount of coverage for sure on this topic and uh unfortunately i think some of it's a little bit misinformation but we certainly do have a, a, a pretty significant bottleneck right now at the processing level where we can't uh we can't move the number of cattle through uh, the packing plants that, that we normally would expect. And 
the supply of cattle in, in feed yards uh, has, been, has been built to uh, achieve a certain throughput that we're not able to achieve today because plain and simple, the personnel that work in those packing plants are either unable or uh, for some other reason are not coming uh, to, to work to the extent that they normally would. And it's a personnel staffing issue. And um, you know, there are many, many facets to that. But the reality is we just don't have enough, uh, enough, enough warm bodies in those plants to, to take care of the many, many tasks that are required. So the cattle supply piece of that, Brian, is that uh, they haven't gone away. Uh, the cattle are in the system in the pipeline, so to speak. And so we have uh, what is upon us now, a, a little bit of a backup, which is kind of the, the piece that's concerning in terms of supply chain management right now. We have cattle in feed yards that uh, have, have, um, have their optimal finish dates either looming or already passed. And so Everyone in the system is very hopeful that we can get through this in the next handful of weeks. Of course, we don't know for certain what that timeline really is, but uh, we do know that the, the firms, the processing plants, we know that their goal is to be back fully functional as soon as possible. But I think we can all understand the, the, uh, the complexity of making that happen. So that's, that's where we are today. And we're just trying to, uh, uh, manage manage things as they are, and we need we just need more throughput as as soon as we can get it. You know, one one of the headlines that we have been seeing, and and you know, I say this coming to you from you know Northeast Ohio, but a lot of our listeners and around the country, and and, and really all over the world. You know, you, you read headlines, you see all of these. Uh, meat processing plants, packing plants going offline because of workers uh, contracting COVID-19. And um, you mentioned there's a bit of a bottleneck at the, at the packers already. And uh, as you look at what's happening uh, in, in things with other proteins, I guess, what is happening in the beef industry? You know, when you, you see, um, you know, other proteins needing to, to call some of their, their animals. Um, is that something that you would ever see in the beef world? And, and I guess if not, I guess, where are those cattle going? Well, we, we do have that logistic bottleneck in terms of getting those cattle through the packing facilities, the timeline we're typically used to. Um, but the good news is that those cattle aren't going anywhere. Um, an inability to harvest those cattle on their originally scheduled date is not a death sentence to euthanize market-ready cattle. Um, that's not happening. We don't have ranchers who are euthanizing their mature cow herds to prevent having fewer calves to come through the cycle. Um, the, the beauty of the life cycle of beef cattle is that we, we do have the advantage of having a longer time to be able to hold those animals over. Um, you ask where they're going, they're staying right where they are. If I'm a cattle, if I'm a professional cattle feeder caring for a group of cattle that the packing facility can't take, they're going to stay right there in my feed yard under the professional care of our nutritionists, um, of veterinarians. Um, we may make some changes in the feed ration or the diet of those cattle um, to maybe try to slow slow things down a little bit in terms of their percent protein and, and, uh, and, and caloric intake and whatnot, um, but they're just going to stay in a hotel for a little bit longer, essentially. You know, I, I, as you look around, and, and if you only follow headlines that you read, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of doom and gloom. There's a lot of things, you know, there's a lot of people in really difficult positions, you know, not just, you know, chefs and restaurateurs and food service folks, but obviously, you know, all the way back to the ranch is being impacted by all this. But I mean, you both still get up. I mean, you still go out, you take care of your cattle, you, 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 you do, you know, you're still motivated to do what you do instinctively. And, and when you look at that and everything that's going on, I guess, what is that that, that keeps you motivated? What are, what are the, the bright spots that you get to see every day that, you know, that um, encourage you to, to, to keep pushing on? Well, this time of year, for a lot of people, it, uh, it's pretty easy to be motivated by baby calves. That's uh, seeing those babies out there is, uh, is a motivator because, frankly, the, the love of the livestock is a big part of the lifestyle. So it's, 
it's at least somewhat uplifting to go out and see this year's crop, if you will, and and be hopeful for what that represents, whether it be the the heifer calves that will be uh, will be your mature cows in a couple of years, or or whether it be the feeder calves, the steers that uh, will be sold. There's always hope in that, and that's just agriculture. It's a hopeful business, and you can't really be in it if you if you don't have kind of that instinctual uh, hope, because it's it can be it can be very disappointing, and it can be very sad at times. And there, let's not uh, let's not candy coat it and say that some some ranchers and farmers will not go out of business due to the challenges that they're facing today, because that's real. But it's also very individualized and in every, every scenario is a little bit different than the next. But um, you know, we do know that we're in the food business and that's very motivating that you know, we have not only a very important protein source that people want, but we actually have the preferred protein uh, amongst our, our competitors here in the largest categories that we produce here in the United States with, with beef. And trying to produce something like the Certified Angus Beef brand represents a, a goal to produce a, a product that is the, uh, is the utmost in, in desirable foods for people uh, when they go out to eat. So, you know, that, that may sound a little hokey, but uh, it is a business of... Uh, of traditionalism and, and everlasting hope and as long as you can hang on through a through a bad storm or a bad season if you will then we believe normally we'll come out to to better circumstances on the other side and that's what so many producers and not just beef producers but but agrarians uh, across across the globe um, that's the kind of hope that they have and it's a uh, you got to get out of bed and take care of the take care of the chores. And if you don't have some hope, you better find something else to do. Paul, well, you're absolutely right. You know, people people don't get into the ranching or farming business for three years or for five years. This is it's a long term deal. Even if you are a first generation rancher, um, you're this is a business you get into for the long haul, um, and you know that there are going to be times when it's lower than it is higher whether that's prices, expenses, whatnot, you're, you're going to ride out some bad times. Um, the hope is that you have more good times than you do bad times um, and, uh, and try to have a little bit of long-term optimism. You know, the other thing that, uh, think about trying to keep your spirits up, you know, anyone who's in professional cattle care, whether you're a rancher or cattle feeder, um, you know, the, the goal is to make sure that the cattle never have a bad day. Everything you do from a management, nutrition, health perspective um, is to make sure that you take care of the cattle, that they don't have a bad day. Um, none of my cattle out there in the past year have any idea that COVID-19 is going on. They don't know what the markets are doing, what the stock markets do. They, they don't have any idea. doesn't matter to them. Um, and so the, the fact that there's this gray thundercloud going on uh, around us, it doesn't change the fact that we want to make sure they don't have a bad day. Uh, so that's something that, uh, that you try and, and keep in the back of your mind. It's like anything else. Um, you know, fi find a good mentor in this business. Um, you know, every good rancher or farmer I know has had a good mentor at some point, whether that was a parent, a business partner, um, a professor from an animal science class. Um, and, and sometimes it's just healthy, even for your own mental health, to do a self-check with, with a mentor who's in this business, because um, it's really easy to find someone else to complain with. Um, but when you find somebody else that can bring a little bit of optimism to, to your negative day, and hopefully you can pass that on to someone else down the line, um, I, I think that's good for everybody right now, no matter what occupation or line of work you're in. One of the words that I've, that I've heard brought up, especially in the, the food service um, <clears throat> distri uh, distribution industry that's going on, you know, um, you know, these are guys who've made their living, you know, running trucks all over cities, selling directly to restaurants overnight. A lot of those restaurants were either shut down or, you know, had to severely limit a lot of their business because of uh, being held to take out restrictions and things like that. Uh, it's the, the word pivot, you know, I, I 
we've heard from a lot of, you know, businesses in terms of how they've been able to pivot. We've seen a lot of examples in terms of how they've been able to quickly change their business model uh, in order to, I guess, navigate what's going on here. Um, any examples of how you guys have had to, to kind of shift business models uh, to, uh, to, to manage things? I think uh, cow producers are probably the, uh, they're probably more experienced in pivoting and making um, spot adjustments to their business than, than many other people because um, this is not the first market disruption they've endured, whether that's a drought, a blizzard, um, you know, whether you determine, if you decide to graze cattle for a little bit longer here, or there, depending on what annual rainfall has been, um, the idea of pivoting or flexibility, if you will, is it's not a foreign concept. Um, I think uh, the, the way folks are considering some of their cattle marketing uh, may be a way that they decide uh, to pivot here or there. Um, you know, we already talked a little bit about adjusting nutrition in terms of how long those cattle um, are on feed before they go to harvest. Um, there's another way that we've, we've seen adjustment. Um, Paul, I don't know, what are some of the examples you guys are seeing in your neck of the woods? Well, I think the primary example is that uh, folks that own cattle that, that are looking to, to merchandise those cattle, typically during this time of the year, if it's possible, that is being delayed uh, because the, the price, uh, whether it be fed cattle or feeder calves, uh, or breeding animals, the price is, uh, is not particularly good right now. And that would be saying it lightly. So if there's an opportunity to delay marketing, that is certainly happening. And of course, those finished cattle in the feed yards that, that we talk about in terms of, those are the animals that are ready to be harvested and, and that is part of the bottleneck issue. That's more challenging, but they will also be delayed because the system is, is essentially forcing that today. But lots of different ages of cattle are, are out in the country. And fortunately, for a lot of, uh, for a lot of ranchers and, and backgrounders, you know, they can make a decision that we are going to own those animals longer. And hopefully, in a number of months here, uh, the price will be better because we will have a, a shift in the economics of, of the cattle business. So. That's the biggest pivot, and oftentimes that involves finding somewhere for cattle to to reside that is different than what we typically do, you know, in our own operations. We may have to look outside to find some pasture or some other feed source to make that happen. Excellent. So in the words of the great Kenny Rogers, know when to hold him, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. <laughs> Of course, in addition to their uh, to their exploits on their on their ranches, uh, respectively, in Kansas and Nebraska, you know, you both you both have full time jobs with Certified Angus Beef. Um, tell us, uh, and Paul, we'll go ahead and start with you, just just so we don't step on each other in the audio. Um, Paul, tell tell us about what your role is uh, for Certified Angus Beef. Well, we have the unique opportunity for our company and our brand to to represent the supply side. So all of, all of what we do, I shouldn't say all, because we do work across the different sectors of the beef supply chain, but our primary role is, is in supply development. And it's a unique uh, spot to be in, given the fact that our brand does never own any beef, nor do we ever own any cattle. So to develop a supply in a scenario where you don't own the product is kind of a challenging concept. But uh, fortunately, the supply chain does reward producers of cattle that meet our brand standards. So it's our job to make certain that the, that, that economic message is shared throughout the chain in terms of awareness that producers all the way back to the cow-calf level from, from the packing plant back all the way to the source, the producers are engaging in that reward process and understand how they can achieve that. And so that is, uh, I think that encapsulates a lot of our job. Now, what does that mean from a day-to-day -day basis? It's very seasonal, depending on what's going on. Um, you know, any state USA, really. But uh, we, I interact with producers on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Also speaking at several different engagements or seminars throughout the year. Uh, attend some bull sales 
and certainly try to uh, to to visit a number of uh, cattle feeding operations strategically throughout the year. As well, I report on market conditions for our staff on a weekly basis and uh, do some writing with, uh, with the publication that we put out every two weeks, the CAB Insider, which is market-based info and some insights into the things that make our brand tick. That also crosses over into several things that, that Kara does, um, but maybe she can share some of those with us as well. Yeah, to Paul's point on uh, developing more supply for the brand, we know that not all Angus cattle are good enough to meet our brand standards. And so when I think about what we do, everything we do goes back to helping those farmers and ranchers try to, try to let more of their cattle meet our brand standards. And not because we're lowering our standards, but because we're, we're helping with the, the educational process in terms of what we can do on a management um, and cattle rearing decisions to meet more of those standards. So whether that's the the one-on-one -on -one meetings, the seminars, um, we're really engaged in a lot of relationship building, just like every other business, it's the people business. And, and the better relationships we can build with some of those cattle industry influencers, um, the more impact we can have on raising a, a better supply of, of more high quality beef as we build that consumer demand on the other side of the company. Um, I also spend a, a good chunk of my time um, being a bit of a bridge, if you will, from, uh, from the supply side of things on, on cattle production to our end users, whether that's retail, food service. Um, we realize that there's a very small percentage of our population today who are involved in any kind of hands-on cattle production. Uh, we're all multiple generations removed from growing up on a farm or ranch today. And, and a, a good chunk of our licensee population, folks who are ultimately responsible for selling the certified Angus beef brand, um, very few of them have a, a great understanding about what goes into high quality beef production before it winds up in a box in the back of their warehouse or in a box in their cooler. And uh, one of the number one requests we get as a brand today is from many of our licensees, be it chefs or food service distributors, um, they want the opportunity to get some more face time with ranchers. They wanna to get to know the folks who are behind high quality cattle production. And so I have the opportunity to help facilitate a lot of different tours, um, some one-on-one some -on -one encounters where we wanna be able to introduce some of our, our chefs or our distributors or our retailers um, to the folks who are truly the owners of the brand. You know, the Certified Angus Beef brand is owned by the American Angus Association and those are the ranchers that, that Paul and I work with as, as a portion of our audience. Um, and it's, it's really fun to have the opportunity to introduce them to the folks who are ultimately responsible for driving demand for their cattle by selling high quality cuts of beef. Kara, we've established the fact that you're in, in Kansas, I almost said Canada. Um, but, uh, you know, farming is, is something that, farming, ranching, I guess, if you're west of the Mississippi, right, uh, is something that is uh, a lot of times, you know, it's a, it's a family business. A lot of times it's a multi-generational family business. Um, you're not originally from Kansas, but you grew up in the industry, right? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a transplant a few times over, a, a gypsy, if you will. I uh, grew up in southern Indiana, where I was the third generation on our family farm there. Um, actually, one of, my, one of my favorite pictures here in my office is a, a picture of a beef carcass that has the certified Angus beef roll and the USDA prime roll, both up the side of it. Um, from an animal that my dad and my father raised. Um, back in the early 80s, they were selling selling finished cattle into the Certified Angus Beef brand in the early days of the brand. And so um, working for Certified Angus Beef today feels kind of like a, an extension of the family business for me. I grew up on a diversified farm. We had Angus cattle, we had row crops. Um, today, my dad and my, my sister still um, run that same farm today. Um, when I moved to Kansas, it was a, a transplant of marriage, if you will. Uh, my husband is a he's a farmer here. We live about three miles from where he grew up, and uh, you don't pick that up and and move it anywhere in the country. So we are here um, close to his home place today. Uh, yes, we're west of the Mississippi. We still call ourselves a farm because we're pretty well diversified 50/50 between the crops and the cattle. But uh, it, it's a heritage that you take with you whether you're on the the same family business where you grew up or or in someone else's. Um, it's, uh, it's just something that, uh, that we're proud of um, and something that we hope to, to grow and continue for future generations. Paul? Yeah, I'm a, 
I'm a uh, third generation agriculturalist uh, here. You know, my dad uh, moved to Colorado from Iowa when he was a young, young married man, and uh, he wanted to he wanted to be a cowboy, and that was specifically the reason he moved. He was uh, from a farming background, and he was more interested in beef cattle and in cowboy lifestyle. So he achieved that early in his life, and I'm pretty happy that he did because uh, it's been something that's appealed to me. Um, you know, greatly as well. And so it was always horses and cattle for me since I was a little, little buckaroo. And uh, of course my life uh, professionally has taken me on a little different path than what I would have thought maybe when I was a young lad, but always keeping a foot in, in agriculture and specifically the cattle business has been uh, important to me. And fortunately I've been able to, uh, uh, work for a very, a very great company here with Certified Angus Beef and also continue to pursue, you know, both day and night, my, my passion for cattle, whether it be through employment or, or my own personal endeavors. So I did spend some time in the feed yard uh, business uh, briefly after college. I was feedlot manager at the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center as well. So that was one step uh, in, in my brief professional story, since most of my working years have been here at, at Certified Angus Beef. But um, yeah, always, always a big fan of, of cattle and, and cowboy lifestyle, even though not every day uh, requires those skills of me. It's, it's certainly where my passion and my, my love lies. Can you rope a calf? I can. I can also miss one. <laughs> I need a couple of tries depending on the day. <laughs> you know, I, I was in, uh, I, I, I was in Fort Worth and I desperately wanted to ride my first mechanical bull because I'm from, you know, Ohio. And, uh, turns out the place we went didn't have a mechanical bull. They had a real bull. And <laughs> I, I politely declined <laughs> that offer. So, uh, well, yeah. Good. good move there, Brian. <laughs> My chiropractor thanked me as well. So, uh, that said, uh, guys, that is about all the time we have today. Uh, if this is your first time listening to the Meat Speak podcast, know that you can catch us across all of your major podcasting platforms, Google Play, Spotify, and Apple, or simply by searching certifiedangusbeef.com slash podcast. Uh, one more time, Mr. Paul Dykstra from Chapel, Nebraska, Ms. Kara Lee from Leavenworth, Kansas, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking time out of your busy day. And I mean busy because you're working a full-time job and running farms and ranches. So, guys, uh, I wish you the best and, uh, and uh, certainly hope uh, that you and your entire communities come out of this uh, uh, really, really well. So thank you guys again for taking time.